Today, we are joined by Theo Versteeg from Topspin Technologies and Dave Zelnock, head women's coach at the Citadel. They're here to present Taking an Active Approach to Concussion Risk Mitigation in Volleyball, a case study featuring the Citadel. Quickly, I'll, I'll run through sort of the history of how we got started, and then I'll hand it over. Um, thank you for those joining us and those watching. Um, my my last stop and my last school we had a, a good run up and then our last two seasons we were very very injury prone a lot of those were the normal injuries we've all been through with acl shoulder injuries some of them not too normal we had um you know one kid held her breath doing a clean and her retina popped um but one thing we, we started was we saw a lot of concussions um then i came to the citadel and in my first year alone we had eight head injuries and some of those were concussions and some of those weren't uh, deemed concussion but they were uh, serious enough that kids missed time one of them was a kid who our third day in preseason got kneed in the head and she missed that entire season she had neurological issues and she ended up medically retiring and she was just a sophomore so it was a, a serious issue and you know talking to a lot of my peers my friends in coaching they're experiencing the same issues. They're they're losing kids for serious amounts of time. These kids are having issues, you know, with academics and their personal lives because of concussion. And then, you know, on the coaching side, we're losing matches because of this issue. Um, obviously, the NCAA is handling things on the back end with testing protocols to get back in, but there's no one really doing anything on the front end of how do we prevent this from happening. Um, we do a lot as coaches to prevent the ACL on the shoulder. We all do the stretches and the active warm-ups and all those things, but I hadn't really heard of anyone actively trying to prevent the concussion, which was something I thought maybe we could do. Um, so that's kind of what started me on the, the journey to try and find out how we could prevent this. So like I said, eight head injuries in one, one season, that was kind of a, a wake up call that we had to figure this out. So started um, looking around finding out um, you know from people that maybe this was something we could prevent and that's what um, you know led me to Theo and uh, one of the things that you know talking to him when when I first first met him he said I don't know if you remember this or not he said if 90 percent of sports is mental shouldn't we protect protect our brain and I was like that makes a lot of sense um that was the thing that stuck with me the most and that was the thing that got me sold on yeah we have to really devote time to this so that's what got me to we have to do something to prevent these concussions to protect our athletes and um do a little bit more so uh with that that's sort of that was sort of our problem and then we turned to theo and he's been the one helping us solve it um so theo if you want to start working through yours, then at the end, I'll I'll tell everyone how we're using it uh, currently, and we'll go from there. Great, all right. Thanks, Dave, for the, uh, uh, yeah, kind of warm introduction, I appreciate that. And uh, I'd also like to thank the ABCA for, um, you know, having me speak to you today. Uh, certainly it is, um, you know, as Dave was mentioning, uh, you know, well, it's an exciting topic, and it's also very timely, I think, it's uh, rare that you can kind of you know turn on the news or uh, or uh, you know, even in the volleyball magazines and uh, without seeing something about um, you know the the concussion epidemic if we're not talking about the the COVID nineteen epidemic. So um, thank you so much for uh, uh, giving me your attention today. And uh, yeah, so hopefully we can kind of go through and and talk about you know a few things with uh, with concussion and what we feel is. Uh, Certainly, an, an opportunity at, uh, at at least risk mitigation, if uh, if not complete uh, prevention. So, as uh, as Dave and Allison alluded to, so uh, my name is uh, Theo Versteeg. I'm a physiotherapist by training. I ended up doing my PhD back in uh, I guess 2012 to 2016, exploring the role of dynamic neck strengthening on decreasing concussion. So, I'm going to first kind of talk about a few things uh, around concussion. And uh, you know, probably a lot, a lot of this will be, most people if you're paying attention to concussion are aware that yeah, it's a pretty big problem. And uh, so with concussions in the United States alone, there's an estimated about 3.8 million sport and recreation related concussions each year. That happens annually. And at the high school level, about one in 10 high school athletes will suffer concussion each year. 
of those athletes, about 40% of them have had a previous concussion. And the strongest predictor of future concussion risk is a history of concussion. So this ends up leading to three to six times increased risk if you have had a previous concussion. And that's like right now as a concussion researcher, that's what people can kind of hang your hat on with predictive value going forward. The other interesting thing that uh, perhaps a lot of people aren't aware of, but a history of concussion, not only is it indicative of someone's future concussion risk, but it's also indicative of a threefold increased risk of lower extremity risk. Um, I'm happy to go into kind of details as to the underlying theory as to why that is, uh, but needless to say, you know, sometimes if you've got those athletes who have those chronic ankle sprains, an underlying issue that may be one of the driving forces is a history of concussion as well. So with volleyball specifically, next to ankle sprain, concussion is the most common injury in women's volleyball, in both time loss and occurrence. <clears throat> now, um, you know, as Dave alluded to, I'm going to speak to you a bit about uh, kind of the neck and its role in, in concussion. So with neck strength, there was a study that looked at over 6,700 high school athletes, and after controlling for gender and sport, sport they showed that for every one pound of increased neck strength, that led to a 5% decreased risk of concussion. We also know that preseason complaints of neck pain are associated with almost a doubling of the increase in uh, concussion risk, but 1.7 times increased risk. Complaints of neck pain as a physiotherapist and uh, uh, anyone kind of out there who has seen a lot of concussion knows that when there's complaints of neck pain, this is also associated with a prolonged recovery from sport-related concussion. Interestingly, in sex comparable sports such as volleyball and, uh, and soccer, women, females are about 1.8 times increased risk of sport-related concussion. And coincidentally, on average, men are about 1.8 times greater neck strength than females. So that's the kind of, uh, just kind of a brief overview, I think, of, uh, of neck strength. I'm gonna go through a way to assess neck strength and um, if anyone's you know interested in, in further detail on this i'm happy to share um, uh, a paper that we have published on this uh, but this is uh you know there aren't there are kind of a number of clinics or um, uh, certain facilities you know out there um, at the university level at least in the, the states that will have access to what's called a handheld dynamometer so this is a way of measuring strength and force so i'm going to go through this method of measuring neck strength which will give you at least as mentioned above, a proxy for assessing someone's concussion risk. The advantage of this method is it uses self-generated force so it's safe, so you don't have to worry about kind of pushing on somebody's head. It provides full multiplanar assessment, so it includes axial rotation. It's portable, you just need a handheld dynamometer, and it's highly reliable. With um, For those that are kind of the stats nerds out there, it's an ICC at 0 0.94, 0.97, and a one week later, it's about 0 0.87, 0 0.94. Uh, perfect, reliably, uh, or perfectly reliable device is one. And um, so anything above nine is excellent. Uh, it is valid, it's going to be uh, uh, published soon. And it's quick and it's not dependent on the strength of the assessor. Disadvantages it does require sufficient upper extremity range of motion in both shoulder, elbow, and wrist. And you're potentially limited by the strength of the, uh, the therapist or the, uh, the athlete's. Uh, upper extremity and not necessarily the neck strength. That's also sensitive to the placement of the, in the palm of the hand. Uh, so fortunately with volleyball athletes, if you have someone that can't reach uh, over the head, they probably shouldn't be playing volleyball. So just gonna briefly say with calibration, you take the handheld dynamometer and put it in between and you're just gonna squeeze it through here. This gives you just a quick measurement of how much force the athlete's able to generate with their arms. And so long as the unilateral strength assessments uh, are significantly less than this value, you can be confident that it's neck strength that's limiting their um, uh, limiting their, their force production. So flexion is taking the device, reinforcing it, putting it on the forehead, having the athlete push forward as hard as they can. Extension, putting it behind uh, at the base of their head and pushing back as hard as they can. Right side flexion, putting it just above the ear and pushing to the right side and then the left side. And then right rotation and left rotation and placing it on the chin having the athlete clench the jaw and rotate to the right and to the left. And this will provide you six planes, full planes of movement. So it does, which is how the neck moves the head. So flexion and extension, right and left side flexion, right and left rotation, gives you the, uh, the frontal plane, the transverse plane, and the sagittal plane of, uh, of movement. 
And then you can create a composite neck strength score, which is flexion plus extension. So all those individual six scores added together and divided by six. And then we've got normal composite neck strength values for um, healthy uh, adult males and females. And then this also provides a neck strength symmetry score, which is a measurement of how much variability there is across the neck. Basically, you want to have the neck as well balanced and symmetrical with the neck strength as possible. The greater the discrepancy across, you know, for instance, flexion and extension, the higher the risk of concussion and, and head movement. So now we've got a, a method of measuring neck strength. How do we strengthen that? Certainly a lot of facilities uh, out there have, uh, hopefully, actually, hopefully not too many have them this way, which is taking a heavy weight, strapping it to the person's head and moving through neck range of motion, which is a terrible idea. Uh, if you have these, I would highly recommend throwing them out. And, uh, but another common uh, modality would be the four-way neck, uh, four neck machine, which strengthens the neck, pushing to the right, pushing to the left, and forward and back. So the key thing with traditional neck strengthening is that is, in essence, taking heavy weight and pushing your head against it. That will improve your neck's ability to take a heavy weight and push against it. But it, is, it does not necessarily improve the neck's ability to stabilize the head in space against a potentially concussive blow. So for that, we're going to dig into a bit kind of uh, more of the uh, a bit of the weeds and a bit more of the kind of minutia, the, the, the finer points of neck strength and, and specifically how muscles work because we know muscles respond very specifically to the type of train you expose them to. And as I mentioned, if you just take a heavy weight and push your head against it, that will improve your neck's ability to take a heavy weight and push against it. It will not improve its ability to kick in suddenly and stabilize the head after it gets popped in the head by a volleyball. So looking at how most concussions happen, for instance, in volleyball, what does that mean? How do we have to kind of address um, that issue of neck strengthening? In order to do that, we know that concussions are true multi-planar events, meaning that they're not just coming straight on. You'll get, you know, athletes who are hit from the side or hit, you know, directly on the face, which involves true multi-planar direction. So you're going to have, you know, a uh, flexion component, a uh, an extension component um, or a, a side flexion and rotation component. So you're going to need the strength of the neck in a true multiplanar fashion to address all of those directions. Next, as I mentioned when we measure neck strength symmetry, there's evidence out there to suggest that the worse balance there is across the domains of neck strength, the higher the head, the higher acceleration the head is exposed to when it's exposed to an impulse injury. So you need to improve or enhance that neck strength symmetry. Next, we know that concussive events are a sudden load that are applied where the muscles have to absorb that load, not generate the load to push against. So again, that kind of comes back to the comparison with traditional neck strengthening where you're taking a weight and you're generating load to push to move it. You're not taking that load and absorbing it to stop your head from moving. So that has a, that in that component, the difference is a concentric versus an eccentric contraction. So we need to train the muscles eccentrically to absorb a load, not to generate a load. Next, we need to facilitate the natural protective stretch reflexes in the neck, and we need to enhance the natural neuromuscular control so that the appropriate muscles kick in and stabilize in a very sudden fashion to help stabilize the head against a potentially concussive blow. And the other thing we know is we know that concussions are very fast events. And so we need to focus on the fastest twitch fibers. These are the type 2 X fibers, and they are literally three times faster than the next fastest, fastest muscle fibers, which are type 2 A fibers. Unfortunately, traditional neck strengthening actually converts your type 2 X fibers, your super fast fibers that are fast enough to protect your head in the much slower type two A fibers. So yes, you get stronger and you get better at pushing against a heavy weight, but those muscles become less responsive and slower to contract in order to actually protect the head from the concussion. And finally, and most importantly, it's gotta be safe. You can't run the risk of causing a concussion while you're trying to strengthen the neck in order to prevent it. So 
it's a fairly tall order when it comes to neck strengthening because there's not much out there. But we feel that we've kind of come up with a with a solution, and that is the Topspin 360. Admittedly, on first blush, it looks absolutely absurd and kind of ridiculous, especially if you see someone training on it. However, uh, a very smart man once said, if at first the idea is not absurd, then there is not no hope for it at all. So I think we've got some hope. Now, I'm going to go through with you again some of the, uh, a bit more of the kind of science and the physics side of things on uh, on how the top spin works and, and kind of really what the metric is that we use to measure performance and the ability to protect the head. So if you were to take all those five parameters that I went through, multi-planar uh, training, uh, basically neck strength symmetry, focus on eccentric or ballistic contractions, fast twitch fibers, and the neuromuscular control, that can be all wrapped up to, into a single value, which is known as the rate of force development. This is force over time. It's how quickly can those muscles generate protective force to stabilize the head. And it's usually measured in, in, uh, in scientific literature, it's in newtons per second. Uh, however, I don't know anyone who can easily think in newtons per second. So we convert it to pounds of force per second, which is exactly as it sounds, the pounds of force that you can generate in a second of time. And what this incorporates in is what's known as centripetal force. So uh, again, this won't be on the exam, but uh, centripetal force, for those who are interested, is mass times velocity squared over r. The interesting thing about this is that it's velocity squared. So as the weight at the end of the, of the hammer for the top spin spins faster and faster, as the athlete gets it spinning faster and faster, the velocity goes up the force goes up exponentially because it's velocity squared. Now, when we're looking at, as I mentioned, rate of force development, that's force over time. And I hope you can appreciate that as the velocity goes up and as that force goes up exponentially, as the velocity goes up, the time per revolution goes down. This has the effect of creating another exponential factor on that rate of force development such that someone who's spinning at 135 RPM versus 270 RPM is a dramatically different rate of force development compared to just the change in RPM. So I'm going to switch and show you this video. Um, just before I kind of press play on this, I'm gonna go on to mute. Uh, you're gonna to want to turn the volume down on your, uh, on your audio. Uh, simply because these uh, these videos are quite loud. So we're going to start off with a 135 RPM. And 135 RPM, is equi that was equivalent to three pounds of force per second. This next video I'm going to show you is 170 RPM. So we're adding on 35 RPM, but this equates to six pounds of force per second. Again, check the volume. So I hope you appreciate that the is going a little bit quicker though. And it requires a bit more force. Now this next video is going to be 45 RPM more and whoops, and so we're at 215, but this is equivalent to 12 pounds of force. So this is already four times the initial video that you saw and double the last one. So we can push it again. Increased effort going into that, and it's, it's significantly harder than you know, a two-thirds increase uh, speed. And now this last video is 270 RPM. So this is doubling the initial speed from 135 to 270. However, it equates to 24 pounds of force per second. So an eight fold increase in the rate of force development. So I hope people can appreciate the uh, dramatic kind of upscale in the amount of force. You also have to be a lot more careful of any chandeliers when you're training at that speed. 
So I'm going to go back to my uh, my presentation there. Hopefully people can kind of get an appreciation as to how that works. Um, it's also important to note that with those, uh, you know, as I'm spinning that, you know, a lot of people are like, oh my God, that's crazy. There's no way I'm putting any of my athletes on that crazy looking thing, right? The way that I'm, the only reason I'm able to get up to 24 pounds of force is because I've got enough strength, proprioception, neuromuscular control, stability, and balance in order to get to that speed. If you are missing any one of those components, you will not be able to get anywhere near that speed. You will always be limited by whatever system of your neck stability is the limiting component. And so it's inherently safe because it's much like a hula hoop in that you can't get the device going any faster than you're able to get going. When you see someone who's really good at hula hooping, it looks like they're barely moving the hips at all and the, the, the hoop's just whipping around them. It's the same idea. Um, if you kind of lose coordination of the hula hoop, the hula hoop just drops. And it's like, it doesn't matter what you do with your hips after that, you're not getting any spinning of the hula hoop. So the same thing happens with the helmet, is if you miss time as you're working on that stability, the weight stops spinning instantly and the resistance is taken away. So, um, that varies. There's the uh, the videos. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, the research that we've done so far. Admittedly, the initial research has been predominantly in uh, in football, as you can imagine, and uh, in women's soccer because uh, men's football and women's soccer are both the uh, you know depending on the literature you look at, they're about on par with their incidents for concussion. So I'm up at uh, Western University here in Canada, and I've got uh, had access to their uh, the women's soccer team. So in uh, March, by the time we get ethics approval, we, um, uh, we started training all of the, the soccer athletes at Western. So this was 36 soccer players in March. We assessed their static neck strength, as I showed you at the beginning. We evaluated their neck strength balance or the symmetry and their dynamic neck strength as measured as their performance on the Tosman 360. So that was the rate of force development generated, which comes with the, uh, with the app on the Tosman 360. And every training session is recorded in the app, so it's very easy to go um, after the fact and see how much training each athlete's been doing. We took these 36 athletes and we trained them for about six weeks, you know, in March to April. And it freaks you three times a week. And we would do three sets of 30 to 50 revolutions. As the athletes got better, they were able to do three, uh, they were able to do a set in less than 20 seconds. So this works out to be about six minutes of training load three times a week for six weeks. So I hope everyone can appreciate a fairly low time commitment on, <coughs> pardon me, on the training side of it. Now, as I'm sure many of you can appreciate, these athletes were female soccer players at uh, the university level. And as soon as they were done their exams at the end of April, and the last thing they wanted to do was to hang around to get their neck strengths tested. So we lost track of pretty much all of them as they all went home. But fortunately, being a very captive audience in the fall, they all came back uh, to play, or majority of them came back to play in, uh, in August. So we grabbed them again in August. The original 36 players had dropped down to 25 due to either graduation or the athletes just not being on the team in the fall. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We reevaluated their static neck strength, their neck strength balance, and their dynamic neck strength. And even after a three and a half month hiatus, they still maintained a 106% improvement in their dynamic neck strength. So that rate of force development from you know, six weeks of training, three and a half months earlier, they still more than doubled the rate of force development. Their static neck strength still maintained almost a 17% improvement, and their neck strength balance score decreased which improved by 33 percent most excitingly they went the entire regular season with zero concussions and this is women's soccer these these people are lightning rods for concussions so the fact that they had a zero concussion season is remarkable the head coach has been there for eight years he's never had a zero concussion season minimum they've always had at least three on average they have five but as many as eight <clears throat> now as I mentioned, one of the strongest predictors for future concussion risk is a prior history of concussion. So in, the, in January of 2020, we ran the same study again, and, uh, but we're gonna do, I think it was uh, 10 to 12 weeks of training, 
Uh, however, January 2020, everyone knows that wasn't a good year for anyone. And in March, when we were going to do the follow-up after the training intervention, I actually had to cancel it the Friday before data collection on the Sunday due to our friendly pandemic of COVID. But we did have baseline data collected. And we also asked these athletes in January if any one of them had a prior history of concussion. So back in high school or previous years in university. So we did a subgroup analysis. We took those with a history of concussion and their average rate of force development was 3.85 pounds of force per second. Those with a, without a history of concussion, so known to be at a lower risk of future concussion, scored 7.14 pounds of force, so almost double. And this was statistically significant for less than 0.01. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right here is a graph showing that the all the red squares, the individual squares, um, the x-axis is our individual athletes and ranked with the lowest to highest rate of force development on the top spin. The red squares are those with a history of concussion. The blue diamonds are those without a history of concussion. Mm -hmm. With a cutoff value of four and a half pounds of force, that was able to screen 80% of those with a history of concussion scored below four and a half pounds of force. So 80% of those with, a, with that are higher risk of concussion scored below four and a half pounds of force, whereas 72% of those without a history of concussion scored above four and a half pounds of force. So already this alone, we when you do uh, what's called a receiver operating characteristics curve, which is again a bit nerdy on the stat side, and you put a cutoff value of four and a half pounds of force that provides 80% sensitivity and 72% specificity for detecting those with a history of concussion and hence those at a higher risk of future concussion. The area under the curve, which is a way of determining the efficacy of a screening tool, was ended up being 0.82, which is an excellent screening tool. Right now, in the literature, nothing exists that is nearly this accurate at determining future concussion risk, except for people self-declaring that they've had a, a previous concussion. And we're able to differentiate those with a history of concussion from those without. And so already we have a screening tool that would seem to be just as effective as, as basically nothing, anything else on the market. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's great for soccer. What about volleyball? So this is where Dave comes in and, uh, and the Citadel. So as, as Dave mentioned back in 2018, they had eight head injuries, uh, which a team of you know, about 24 players is fairly significant and substantial. And that's certainly sidelining a lot of the, of the athletes. Um, that's when uh, kind of, you know, we reached out to Dave and vice versa, and they started training on the Topspin 360 in the off season between 2018 and 2019. And now Dave has been kind enough to share, have been collecting the data of his uh, the performance on, with the athletes. And he's been sharing that uh, that with me. We looked at the initial baseline rate of force development, so they're the first time throwing on the helmet, what their baseline value was. And from 2018, between 2018 and 2019, with the or sorry, between 2019 and 2020, with the uh, with their athletes, they started. Oh, let's see if I got that in there about 6.5 pounds of force per second. And after the past kind of couple years of, uh, you know, one to two years of training, they've gone up to 19.79. So that's a 300% improvement in that rate of force development. And again, when you look at the, the research with the soccer, we know that those who are less than four and a half pounds of force are at very high risk of concussion. Between four and a half or nine are at moderate risk. Above nine is, is getting into low risk. So, you know, Dave had his athletes at 6.5, which was actually, you know, they would have been considered moderate risk of concussion, but he's now trained them to an average of 19.79, so almost 20 pounds of force. Now, when Dave was talking about uh, the, uh, that 2018 season, one of the athletes that he had had suffered uh, a significant concussion, and her training, when she started the baseline value, was two and a half pounds of force. After training the past two years, she's now up to 26.9 pounds of force, so an improvement of 1,076%, which is quite dramatic. How did that impact 
Dave's team over the past two years. Oh, that's a, this is just a EMG. I'll come back to that. I think about. Well, in 2018, they had eight uh, head, you know, uh, head injuries after training Thompson 360. 2019, they dropped down to zero head injuries. They continue training on the top spin in uh, 2019 and 2020. So you figure just statistically, you're gonna see a regression to the mean. So there's gonna be a bit of an uptick. Uh, no, they had zero head injuries in 2020 as well. So now going from eight down to back-to-back -to -back zero, back-to-back -back seasons of zero concussions. I'm sure Dave can speak to this, but uh, quite remarkable across the board. I think with, uh, when he brings up you know, that the conversation when we first met, one of the, comments that I remember him saying was that he's been coaching in the NCAA for over 20 years and he's never had a zero concussion season and now he's the proud owner of two concussion free seasons and so certainly one of the arguments would potentially be is that okay fair enough um, you know you, you can just get lucky and just perhaps the uh, the athletes weren't exposed to the same types of, uh, of you know balls beaming off the heads or um, you know heads into the post Type uh, type injury, so that's why they they got lucky. I'm going to show you this video that uh, that Dave shared with me from uh, from I guess January February this time uh, of this year, and hopefully again I'm not sure how the volume is on this, but uh, just be mindful if it, if it gets really loud. So I'm just going to play it a couple of times and and make note of player 21 in the down kind of left hand corner here. And there she goes and ends up doing a head plant into the uh, into the post. Now I'm going to show. Theo, you're muted. Sorry, she takes that spike right off the head, and hopefully you uh, you saw it the second time. And again, face plant into there. Now I'm going to go back to my presentation here, and. Just so that you can appreciate it, I've got in this here. Now, the reason why I showed it outside of my presentation because it's a bit choppy, um, but I'm going to try to kind of play this and see if, actually, let's see if I can do it this way. Yeah. So this I can actually kind of slow it down. I want to show you here. So the ball is coming. So she's ready for it. She's literally watching the play, waiting for this ball. And yet the ball comes so fast, she is not able to get her hands up in time. That beams her right off the face. Look at how high the ball ends up traveling. It literally goes up into the rafters and then eventually comes back down to earth. All right. So I've seen, as a concussion researcher, I've seen a lot of concussion videos. This here is a guaranteed concussion, except for the fact of look at her reaction right after it comes off her face. She's already tracking the ball back on her face, tracking the play. So much so that later on, she has to do a headstand into the post and again, right back into play. So this is quite remarkable. I hope everyone can, can appreciate that. Like that, she just got Let me go back to, uh, oops, it's here. Let me go back to my presentation. Oops, I think I. There we go. Can you see my presentation again? Yep. Yeah. Good. So, after doing, uh, you know, again, it's kind of basic, simple physics when you know um, the, uh, <laughs> the force of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, and the height of the, the gym, able to calculate out the initial velocity from there. And we estimated that the initial velocity coming off of her face, the velocity coming off of her face, so after the spike, was estimated to be over 50 miles per hour. Meaning, just imagine how fast that ball was coming in into her face, and she was completely fine. Afterwards, and, and I think uh, Dave hopefully can uh, can speak to this, but um, they kind of, after seeing that, like, hey, you got your hands up on that, didn't you? No, beat me right off my face. Uh, okay, we need to assess you for a concussion. Why, I'm fine, what, I'm fine. And uh, and yeah, so I think I'll let, uh, I'll let Dave, speak to that because I think we're kind of rounding up there. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to uh, thank you all for kind of listening to me uh, kind of babble on, and I'm going to transfer it back to, to Dave to uh, kind of put on some some finer points on uh, on the training and, and maybe even speak to that uh, to that video a bit. So thanks so much uh, for your time.
And uh, here, I'll just uh, pop out of there. I think everyone can see uh, Dave and I again, I hope. Yeah, so that video is hard to watch uh, for, for a lot of reasons, obviously. She's <laughs> in the wrong position. Um, you know, did a lot, a lot of bad things and lost the match, as um, you know, Wofford's coach reminded me the other day. Um, but yeah, it it was um, you know, Kenzie our libero, she did not get her hands up, but it happened so quickly that I don't think anyone in the gym knew um, that it went off her face because it did happen very very quickly. And um, she was one of our kids who had one of the the lowest scores, and we alerted her to that you know, upon testing that, hey, you're kind of at risk and because of the style that you play, we're kind of concerned. So she she worked pretty diligently to get her score up and um, we keep track of those scores, you know, through the app and her next test, the day after she took that hit, her scores dropped really, really low um, on the, the top spin. But the next one after that went right back up to her normal, you know, where we track. So it, it did have an impact on her neck strength and what she was able to do on the device, but she was fine. I know our trainer did check her out. She passed all of her stuff, but, and she was very annoyed that we made her do that, but you know, she was fine. Um, hopefully everyone understands why I'm on this today. Um, obviously I left all the signs to Theo. This is just so when we get to AAU, you'll associate me with a smart person. You'll say, oh, he was next to the smart guy. That's why I'm on here. Um, but I just wanted everyone to understand how we're, we're using the device. Um, we've never even gotten to his his real protocols. We've been in kind of a modified, what I call preseason protocol, because when we first used the device, I was worried about the kids um, having sore necks because they did. The first couple of times they used it, they were really, really sore. And we were in preseason and, you know, I'm focused on volleyball and I don't, I don't want to sacrifice any of that. So we did um, kind of the, the lowest common, but we did a very small amount of it. And it took two minutes, each kid twice a week. So we did that the first spring and just to get them acclimated to it. Well, then we left for the summer and you know, no one's doing it over the summer because we're not here all summer. And then we came back for the fall, same thing. We're in preseason, we stayed with it. Well, then we're in regular season and I don't want to really amp it up too much. So we stayed in kind of that low protocol and we we're still seeing really good progress. So then the next spring, I'm like, well, we'll just leave it there. We're getting good numbers. I don't want them to get too sore, but the numbers just kept climbing. So we never really advanced the protocol. So I don't really know how high this can go, um, you know, as far as getting those, that RFD up higher and higher and higher. But the other thing is they're competitive. So by nature, now they're doing it and they're, you know, they're the videos we saw of Theo, you know, gritting his teeth and going, I've got some videos of them that I, I'm not going to share just because they would not want me to, but we've got some videos of our girls doing that. And then they're looking at the app, like, what's your score? And they're getting competitive with each other of who can score more and higher. And I'm like, don't, don't do it like that because you're cheating the system. You're just, you're grabbing the locker and, you know, kind of slamming your head around. Um, but really it takes them two minutes twice a week. So even his six minutes, we're not even that far. We're four minutes a week total, and we're getting, we're approaching being bulletproof. You know, our kids are taking shots to the head, and you know, the one of Kenzie that's happening in our gym pretty often. Yes, we're we're teaching things. We we want them to have neutral hands to try and protect their face. But if you saw Kenzie had her hands up pretty high, and it still got through. Maybe if she didn't play defense on the seven foot line, you know, we would have been better situation. <laughs> Um, but we're, we're trying to avoid it altogether. But if that ball gets through and we get hit in the head, we want to make sure that we're protecting the brain. Um, you know, most of our kids aren't going to play professional volleyball. They're, they're going into one of the alphabet agencies, or we've got kids who are going to be doctors. We've got to protect their asset, which is their brain. So that's what we're trying to do here. Um, yeah, I, I think that's about it. You know, we, we've got, We've got enough issues here that uh, that I can't do anything about. This was one that I could, so I, I thought that it was worth the investment, and we've uh, we've had good results from it. So I think uh, I think that's it for for my end. If there's anything else that I'm forgetting, I know I think that uh, I certainly think that kind of covers the most kind of pertinent points. Um, exactly as you said. I mean, it, it's something where 
you know, you can actually take an active approach to to do something. Like concussions aren't something that you just have to, well, that's just part of the game. And, you know, like, yeah, concussions suck, but what are you going to do? Well, this is what you can do, right? Like you can actually start to do something because, as you mentioned, I mean, honestly, yeah, like an ACL, blowing your ACL, yeah, that sucks. You're going to be out for a year. Hopefully you get some good rehab and you'll be back. But that's that's not going to dramatically impact the athlete's life for the rest of their lives. And serious concussions will. As a physiotherapist, a, you know, sport concussion specialist for a number of years, and I can tell you firsthand that there are athletes after significant concussions who are still dealing with the negative ramifications down the road. There is, you know, it's the cost is ridiculous when you look at the impact that even a single concussion can have on some of these athletes and like I, I really think that this needs to be a priority protecting with the athletes going forward because I mean it let alone with the team that's your number one assets asset is your is your athletes but you know hopefully you want to have provide care and concern for them after they're done playing the game right and uh, you know credit to, to Dave for doing that and realizing that you know, his players are his number one asset. It's not like, you know, uh, like um, a paper towel where you use it once and you dispose of it. Like, you know, these players, you want to, you know, provide them a good, solid foundation going forward that it was a positive experience that they played volleyball at a even high school or college level that they can carry on forward as opposed to because they played volleyball and got concussion, they're no longer employable because they've got, they're still dealing with um, post-concussion syndrome. So, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, kind of uh, highlights the things that I wanted to uh, discuss.